you're too kind. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I'm uh, delighted to have been invited to speak at the uh, ODTC conference. I feel a little bit like Daniel in the lion's den, to be honest, in relation to uh, everyone else here who's spoken about the early parts of the uh, supply chain and manufacturing particularly. Um, but uh, I would like to focus on what it is from a retailer perspective we see as being necessary because in terms of the new excellence, that is an, that's a, a, a term or a, a, um, a situation which is changing on a daily basis. So that I call the uh, title of this particular presentation, The Future of Global su uh, Supply Chains, The Importance for Change. And that change is going to involve all of us in every single part of the supply chain. Just quickly, context to his CNA, for those who don't know us, we're a clothing retailer, uh, we're a managed, uh, a family-owned managed business. We celebrated 170 years last year of successful trading in, uh, in Europe. We're now on the sixth generation of the family. That's pretty unusual. And I've already seen the seventh generation coming through. We have around 1,500 stores, 36,000 employees, and 2 million customers coming through the stores every day. It's a company which has uh, clear values that come from the uh, family ownership. Values such as respect, uh, open, deliver, generation. This family thinks in terms of generation. They don't think in terms of the next quarter or the next season. We have a long-term vision about the business and about the relationships. More than 40% of our tier one suppliers have been with us for more than 10 years. And we have a group who've been with us for more than 20 years. That's an important underpinning of our supply base. And actually, we have high standards of ethics and corporate responsibilities, which are expected of ourselves to begin with, and then, of course, with all of our partners with whom we do business. A couple of slides on the industry context, just to start with. In the 1990s, was first focused really on quality management. That's quality management of product, product safety, etc. And the first social issues in supply chains began to emerge. In India, in particular, at that stage, it was about the use of child labor, particularly in the southern part of the country. As a result of that, we saw in the next decade a proliferation of codes and standards, a focus on ethical sourcing, and dare I say, actually, probably audit fatigue as a result. But we're now well into the next generation, which I describe as being about partnership and about sustainability. And the partnerships are not just in the traditional sort of uh, manufacturer to retailer, uh, they're actually about partnerships along the whole supply chain, which I will talk about today. And actually, increasingly, they're about partnerships between competing brands. The most significant development in the last couple of years has been the fact that we now, as part of our daily activities, are working in non-competitive areas with many of our direct competitors. Another industry context, if you like, the global textile industry uses a lot of energy, a lot of water, a lot of raw materials, employs a lot of people, and we've got the more recent uh, addition, thanks to Greenpeace, of a focus on hazardous chemicals. We're not in the Premier League in our, in our industry in terms of our efficient use of declining resources which exist in the world. So how are we linked in at CNA? Now, I'm not going to talk in detail about all of these particular uh, partnerships, but they're all significant in different ways. Some of them here are with NGOs, some of them are with social businesses which uh, uh, are trying to do good. Um, I will talk of some of those as part of my presentation, but I'd just like to pick out one, one at the top. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, um, but this was launched in uh, about 18 months ago and started off as a group of around 30 uh, clothing brands and retailers who got together and started to, uh, to look for the opportunities to cooperate in this non-competing area of the business, social environmental issues. Uh, we launched in March of uh, 2011. The 30 brands which constitute the initial group, the founding circle, account already for 30% of the world's total uh, clothing sales. Already there's a critical mass there of retailers and brands. But actually, significantly, the development in the last 12 months has been the addition of manufacturers, academics, governments coming in, and other actors along the entire supply chain. For me, this is going to be the umbrella organization under which 
most of the developments, particularly in the social and environmental field, are going to happen in this industry. I, applaud, I, I, I sort of implore you all to start thinking and looking at the work that the Sustainable Power Coalition is doing because it's going to impact on everybody in our supply chain in the years ahead. So first of all, a few slides or a few thoughts about what it is motivates we as retailers to actually drive sustainability. Well, the first one I put up here is it generates business value. Less is more. And in the simple terms, that's looking at cutting out waste, reducing costs. But actually it goes well beyond that and it can go into innovation. I'll give you one example. 1,500 stores use an awful lot of lighting at CNA. Lighting accounts for 50% of our energy bill at CNA Europe. We worked with Philips to develop what's called an Amita lighting system. That lighting system uses 20% less energy for the same lux in the stores. And when the consumer is shopping, they want to see the fabric, they want to see the color. So the, the lighting is important. 20% less energy use, 50% of our bottom line is lighting. Easy calculation, we are going to save 10% on our lighting bill at CNA in the years ahead. That's creating business value. And at the same time, it's also helping the environment. Secondly, it has the potential to attract new consumers. I would say it's a bit too early to say that the consumer is really motivated to go out and buy sustainable, uh, sustainable garments. But there is actually a pocket in Europe of around 10% of the consumers who are now getting serious about their selection of brands and retailers to whom they will go. And if I talk about the organic cotton at CNA, which is, which is something I'll, I'll focus on in more detail in a moment, our sales are going up so dramatically. It cannot just be our existing customers who actually are coming and are buying this organic cotton product from us. I'm sure that within that, there's a group of new consumers beginning to join. The third one, and we heard this morning just how critical finance is, how, how access to capital is becoming much more difficult. Now, this isn't so much from a CNA perspective, we're a family business and totally internally financed. But I was reading listening that as much as one dollar in eight these days is invested in companies who can demonstrate that they have a clear sustainability strategy and that they can report by something like the Global Reporting Index or the Carbon Disclosure Project. And that amount of finance is growing and growing. So as a business looking for capital, this can be another driver the sustainability aspects in terms of giving increased access to capital. And of course, lastly, there's risk management. There's so much risk in a, in a clothing supply chain. I don't, have to, uh, I don't have to explain. And therefore, what motivates us as retailers and brands is that we're driven both by the opportunity side as well as the risk. And for CNA, uh, we don't try to separate growth and sustainability. Our approach actually is to try and grow through sustainability. And I think that's where the leading companies are, uh, are going these days. Given that we have a lot of manufacturers in the audience, I thought it'd be good to have this slide. And you know, what, what, what could be of interest for yourselves in terms of driving towards sustainability? And the first two, surprise, surprise, are exactly the same as for retailers. Early adopters of carbon efficiency, water conservation, energy saving, can all go to help to improve your own bottom line. It gives you the opportunity to attract new customers, new retailers, new brands. The group who are under the Sustainable Apparel Coalition are developing a new index. And that index will have a brand, a, a brand component, a product component, and a facility component. The members of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition will be looking to work with manufacturers in the future who can demonstrate that they also have their own sustainability strategies in place, which will help, at the end, the index, the ultimate index for the products we're selling. So in other words, retailers and brands are becoming more demanding. It's not just about fair prices, on-time delivery, good quality, ethical compliance, which is important. It's also about demonstrable social and environmental responsibility at all parts of clothing supply chains. And in the end, the entire supply chain will be held to account. We are used, as a major retailer, of being attacked in the media. Sometimes correctly, 
sometimes quite incorrectly. But it no longer stops at the brands. And I can give you a very kind example in India, not so much in this part of India, but in the south of India. You've probably heard of the system known as Sumangali, the use of bonded labor in the early parts of clothing supply chains. We are under enormous pressure as brands in Europe to distance ourselves from companies who are actually adopting the system. It won't happen overnight. It will take us some years, and we have to work with the industry to help make this happen. But at the moment, the mills associations in southern India do not even acknowledge the system. They deny the system is there. That is causing us as a retailer and many others to have to step back at the moment, insofar as our own manufacturers in that part of the world are not able to influence the early, adopt of the early parts of their supply chain. This is causing now a real problem for brands, retailers such as CNA. We're having to step back from placing as many orders as we probably would have done. So, it's a threat, if you like, here to a manufacturer and, 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 and the early parts of the supply chain in the future. This isn't just in the future about brands being attacked. There will be entire supply chains which will be held to account. Now, I'd like to focus on the four key areas for corporate responsibility at CNA. These are real stories. This is about things we've actually done or have in place at the moment. It's product, environment, and people. And the product I'll concentrate just purely on cotton, simply because it's relevant to us here, particularly in India. And cotton represents more than 50% of the final product we sell. The environment, I'll talk a little bit about water and the detox campaign. And for people, I'll focus on the improved working conditions, uh, an initiative we have for improved working conditions in our clothing supply chains, and a little bit about social compliance. So cotton. Why focus on cotton? As I said, it's the single largest fabric input into what we sell. And cotton cultivation raises significant economic, environmental, and social issues. Economic, we're dealing with marginal farmers with very little access to market normally. Social, just look at what happened in Uzbekistan. That forced retailers like CNA to say, we will not knowingly use Uzbek cotton in our supply chain. Even today, all the schools in Uzbekistan are closed at this point in time because all the children are in the field picking cotton. That is totally unacceptable to us. Uh, environmental, clearly, disproportionate use of water and chemical pesticides and fertilizers. Our own focus, therefore, can no longer be on what I call the organized part of the supply chain, the manufacturing. It goes right back to the origin of the raw material itself and the way that cotton is cultivated. So we've chosen to increase our commitment to the sourcing of certified organic cotton. And I'll talk in more detail of that later on. But we've gone further by establishing the company called Cotton Connect, which is helping us actually to move our conventional cotton also into much more sustainable ways of cultivation, even though it doesn't necessarily go all the way towards organic. And our strategy is based on the valuable partnership of the CNA Textile Exchange and the Shell Foundation. I come back to the idea of partnership. Each partner brings something different. The Textile Exchange, their in-depth expertise of organ organic cotton farming and related business strategy. When we started our journey in 2004, we had no idea where organic cotton was grown, how it was certified, and it was the Organic Exchange then who told us where to start. We bring, of course, our economic power as a business, but also the, uh, our strong commitment to sustainability and to social responsibility, the cultural part of our power, if you like. The Shell Foundation, they help us basically to measure our impact at farm level of the strategy we have in place. And this partnership, it has a purpose to create models of committed, short-term moving to long-term, fair, moving from my interest to our interest, um, and sustainable value chains that deliver significant social, economic, and environmental value. Some of the desired outcomes we have, one at the end of the, the, the one end of the chain, the farms, we want to see the environmental protection and restoration. We want to see economic empowerment of the uh, and inc improved livelihoods of the farmers, social development. I'll cover a few of the examples in a minute. And in fact, through the whole supply chain of cotton. We want to see the business sustainability in the whole, su whole supply chain. Organic cotton is not without its challenges. 
I'm not going to focus on every one of those now, but how are we, as CNA, addressing those challenges? First of all, we're investing in drip irrigation schemes here in India, where that will help to minimize or reduce the amount of water. We've set up a number of schools in farming areas where, in the past, there were no schools. This particular one featured in the middle here is at Dharampuri, near uh, Indora, in central India. We're investing in seed creation um, uh, projects with two of our supply partners here. We're into the third year of developing a source of organic cotton seeds to make sure that we can continue along this journey in the future. I mentioned Cotton Connect earlier, which we've, uh, which we've set up. And what do we get from Cotton Connect? Uh, firstly, I talk about the visibility. It helps us co to connect every stage of the supply chain. Uh, and in terms of integration and alignment, it was so important that knowing the organic cotton is essentially mainly grown in India, we didn't want our buyers then running all over the world to try and get that manufactured into products. Now, buyers don't like being told what to do. But in this case, we set up the supply chain in a totally different way. And therefore, we had to make sure we had the efficiency here in India for the cotton to go through to the ginning, to the spinning, and to the manufacturing. So this journey into organic cotton has pulled in all parts of the clothing supply chains here in India. Supply security is so important. We all know that the world population is likely to grow towards 9 billion. Mega cities will continue to expand. That will mean less agricultural land. And by the way, the 9 billion people would prefer to eat, probably, than to see cotton grow. So we already face a, a very much a constraint in terms of the land available to grow cotton going forward. Insofar as that's 50% of our product range, we've got to be thinking early enough, how can we protect that longer term? One of the uh, strategies for us actually is to uh, diversify our cotton um, purchasing into Africa. We signed a three-year contract with Cotton Made in Africa to help that process. And how do we measure our success so far? From the farmer perspective, you see that their net incomes have improved. Harmful inputs have been reduced, and the farmer's health has improved, both social, environmental, and economic wins. And for us, at the other end, the innovation in our product means that we've moved from 15 million products of certified organic cotton in 2009 to 32 and a half million last year. Our plan was to sell 60 million products made of 100% certified organic this year. We will sell 70. Our plan next year is 100 million garments made from certified organic cotton. Our long-term goal is that by 2020, we will only be using either certified organic cotton or cotton which is grown in more sustainable ways, could be PCI, fair trade, um, or organic, of course. And as I said, we need to diversify our resources to make sure we've got enough access to the uh, cultivated raw material. The environment. I said water is the key element there. We have a partnership with the Water Footprint Network, which was mentioned earlier in the presentation. They're helping us to map our water footprint. They've been working with us for two years on that. And by the end of 2012, they will have computed our water footprint, and particularly amongst that, the, the hotspots. Where are the hotspots? They will superimpose that over the global hotspots. That will allow us to see where we're currently buying our cotton in ways or in areas of the world which are unsustainable. And it will allow us in 2013 to start talking about policy changes we have to make to reduce those impacts. And actually, there's an iconic study, again, which we conducted here in India, given our strength of organic cotton um, sourcing. Uh, the University of Beijing and the University of Enschede in Holland have worked together to come up with a math mathematical model to allow us to see the impact of the grey water footprint in areas which are farmed organically and compare that in areas where cotton is grown conventionally. Surprise, surprise, the grey water footprint is much less impacted adversely where organic agriculture takes place. That's a very powerful tool when we see the impact at the end of this year of our cotton footprint to go to government and say, perhaps, actually, if you were to change your agricultural policy in this particular area, you could have a very positive impact on the water supply to the communities in those areas. And also linked to water, of course, we've got the uh, detox campaign, 
for which we have to thank Greenpeace. Um, the commitment there is to zero discharge of hazardous chemicals by 2020. And at the moment, CNA is one of the seven leading bands who are trying to drive this change. It won't happen unless we can get a lot more brands and retailers, unless we can get everybody in the supply chain, unless we can get the chemical industry, unless we can get governments on board with us as well. But somebody has to start this process. Philosophically, none of us want hazardous chemicals, I'm sure, in our supply chain. But we started out on this, uh, this journey. We started some pilot projects in 2012, measuring what's going in, what's coming out of some, uh, some production units. And that will begin to allow us to see which of a priority group of chemicals are there and look at the alternative green chemistries to see what we can substitute. This is a very important initiative as well. And finally, with people, uh, we've got a very innovative product at, uh, uh, project at the moment which is linked to improvement of production and human resource management in clothing manufacturing. It's called the Sustainable Supplier Program. It's backed by the CNA Foundation. And it has three elements. The first is relating to lean manufacturing, the technical side. The second, though, and this was touched on this morning, how important the involvement of people in the supply chain, people in manufacturing. So we've got specialist consultants going in and educating middle management of the factories we're working with. This isn't just in the technical aspect. This is about the soft skills as well, team building, problem solving, etc., etc. And finally, we're talking or we're educating the workers themselves in terms of what their role, their increased role could be in helping to improve productivity in their particular factory. And these are some of the early results we've got. First of all, a significant improvement has been identified in terms of a 30% decrease in reject rates. And I'm talking on average here from five factories which were part of the pilot projects. A 10 to 30% increase in output per worker a significant decrease in machine downtime, and a 20% increase on on-time shipments. That helps everybody in the supply chain. It's also led to a reduction in overtime working hours and a reduction in staff attrition rates. And the important thing is here, what it tells us, there is a financial model out there which can allow us to start talking about how do we help to make sure that workers are remunerated in a better way than they are currently. We face tremendous pressure also at the retail end to address an issue which is called the living wage. This is CNA's smart way to try and address that particular situation by creating more efficient manufacturing partners who can also invest in their people, including an increased remuneration. And lastly, in terms of social compliance, CNA set up its auditing company in the early 90s. It was one of the first, it's known as SOCAM. Um, but we learn that auditing on enough, of course, on its own is not enough. Increasingly, we're into uh, capacity building with our manufacturers, sometimes one-to-one, -one, sometimes in small regional groups, in the local language, using the local uh, audit uh, teams. We will, in fact, be investing quite significantly next year in building up this capacity management part of our auditing process at CNA. So just a final thought. Today, leadership potential sits in the hands of anyone who can access, analyze, and strategically use information. And that's both an opportunity again and a threat. It means anyone with a smartphone standing in the middle of a field in India can send a very uh, emotive picture globally and instantly. That's the threat. But having an august body of people here representing the indus industry my plea is, let's use our collective industry knowledge in a smart way and show real leadership in driving sustainability issues for the sake of both business and society. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Nair.